Hi, I'm Chris LaForest, and this is episode four of Modern Intelligence. In this conversation, Leo and I are discussing a historical battle, the Battle of Chip Young Ni from the Korean War. And, uh, well, I, I'll let the conversation flow, but I knew nothing about this when we started. I will say, however, uh, if you're looking for my usual high energy self, uh, this is not that conversation. I, when I was doing the editing for this uh, content, uh, I noticed my energy level is like down and it was a very long day uh, when we recorded this one. So if you're looking for something higher energy, maybe go to a different video and come back to this one or, or audio. So uh, Leo and I talk and it's mostly uh, maybe 15% me, 85% Leo. And I hope you find it educational. Hope you enjoy it. Leave comments, like, subscribe and Leo Baron, Chris LaForest, Battle of Chip Young Nee. Why the Battle of Chip Young Nee? Uh, I think probably what explains it the best is it's probably the greatest war story uh, that no one's ever heard of. Yeah. Uh, to be clear, part of the reason I'm legitimately asking why is because I actually never heard of it. Yeah. Uh, and I open up a Wikipedia page just to, just to be aware. Mm -hmm. And it's... I'm just, I'll look at it right now. It's it's of battles. Mm -hmm. It's pretty minuscule. Right. It's not a very robust. You probably wrote half of it, didn't you? No, not for the Wikipedia <laughs> page. Uh, I did, uh, you know, full disclosure, I did write a book about it. Uh, but people have even called it, and people, when I say people, not me, have actually termed it like the Gettysburg of the Korean War. What people? Uh, historians. Uh because, again, if it's really not that big, right. then yeah. what people are talking no, about. No, a lot of uh, uh, Korean War historians, which is kind of an, uh, an oxymoron, there aren't a lot of Korean War historians, but of those out there, it has been kind of called uh, the Gettysburg of the Korean War. Um, which in context means a, a turning like, point. Yeah, a significant turning point. Yeah. Uh, and the Korean War, it's called the Forgotten War because it really is forgotten. It's kind of like... It's sandwiched between Vietnam and it's obviously then sandwiched between the Second World War. Second World War, very popular, a uh, lot of great It's story. like one of the best wars. Yeah, you know, <laughs> the good war. There's even a book called The Good War. Uh, and then Vietnam is this quagmire and it's just, you know, uh, awful and we lost our way, that kind of a thing. And then I mean, Korea is kind of like, where do we put this? You know, it doesn't really... In the minds of society. You know, right. And... Uh, one of the things is like Vietnam was clearly a, a loss and World War II was clearly a W. It was clearly a win. And Korea happened. You know. Uh now I I would argue that if you look at the original goals of the UN when the UN went into the Korean Peninsula to push back uh the North Korean forces, the original goal was just to uh, recreate the status quo antebellum, you know, just to get to the 38th parallel. So if you look at that as, well, did we achieve that objective? And the answer would be yes. Uh, it wasn't until after the landings at Incheon and because they were so successful and uh, the 8th Army pushed north past the 38th parallel and was basically going to reunite Korea. Uh, and that was MacArthur's plan. And then, of course, the Chinese uh, counterattacked in October, November of 1950 and pushes back to the 38th parallel. That's why people tend to say, well, we didn't really win because we didn't reunite. Yeah, but our goal was actually to cease expansion. Right. It, initially, our goal was to just to basically bring us back to the status quo antebellum because once the UN got involved in July of 1950 and in, into August of 1950, the North Korean armies that actually pushed down the UN forces to what we now know today as the Pusan perimeter. Basically, that was all that was left of Free Korea was that little enclave in the Pusan perimeter. And it wasn't until uh, the end of August and September of 1950 when we had the Incheon landings. Uh, there was a counteroffensive coming up for the Pusan perimeter. And then in the North Koreans were completely defeated and pushed north of the 38th parallel. Sometimes I hear about the Korean War, for example. This is actually the best example. And it's like, World War II is four years ago. This, this is like, I'm a freshman in, in high school and 
the war is over. I'm like, oh, my whole, you know, grade school and junior yeah. high, I've been hearing about war and, and Americans were in the war for four years, the right. World War II. And it's like, oh man, so junior high, I, I was oh, the dealing with this war and the, you know, all the rationing and stuff. And then I'm like, okay, I'm going to have a normal high school. Like, you know, I'm going to have peace. Okay. And then I'm a senior and like, hey, war again. Yeah. Well, and not a big one, but yeah, I mean, well, it could have been, it was definitely there was a draft and people were getting drafted to serve. And there's no way to know that it wasn't going to turn right. to continue right back to where we and were. And it was certainly a, a concern amongst uh, the administration as in our allies that it was kind of like the opening shot in the third world in the third world war. And so that was definitely a major consideration. How do we keep it localized? How do we keep it from spreading? Ultimately, that's what got MacArthur fired. Uh, Did he want to use nukes? Yes, he wanted to expand the war into China. Uh, and yes, there were, you know, parts of his plan was, hey, we're going to start dropping nukes, <laughs> you know, on Chinese cities. And that is what ultimately got him fired by the President Truman. Because President Truman's like, we are not going to expand the war into China. We're going to try to keep this a localized regional conflict and not turn it into a, you know, the third world. So without war. getting too semantic, because you could say, oh, you're just being semantic. But it was a win. Yeah. Like we accomplished what we were meant to do, which was to stop the spread of communist China more South than where it already was. And, and it, yeah, no. And, and all you got to do is go to Korea today and you look at North Korea and North Korea for lack of a better word sucks. Um, it's not a place I'd want to live. It's a problem. Yeah. And South Korea is the 15th largest economy in the world. So this particular battle, the Gettysburg of this Korean right. War, is physically where, first of all? Like, uh, in relation to Korea? So it's in the central portion of the peninsula. I mean, it's almost dead center in the peninsula. Uh, it's still on our side of the 38th parallel. South. Yep. So you can actually visit it. You know, there's a museum there, and there's it's, you know, it's a, it's a battlefield park. Uh, and, and there's an actual town called Chipyongni. Chipyong, yep, yep. And it's, it's relatively undeveloped uh so it's not that significantly different from what was going on in terms of just the layout uh, back in uh, 1951 uh and like i said it's in the central part of the peninsula uh i've i've been there um and the terrain of course it, like i said it hasn't changed so you really do get a picture of hey those are all the mountains around it uh and it's an interesting battlefield a lot of uh soldiers that go there um, from the U.S. Army do staff rides out to it. So it's definitely something you can visit. And there's a lot of professional development opportunities when you serve uh, in the Korean Peninsula. Um, I actually know the Colonel William Alexander retired as the guy that leads a lot of the staff rides uh, out to the battlefield. Um, the Rock Army does staff rides out there. Um, the, the Republic of Korean Army does a lot of staff rides. So it's a big, in the myth of the Korean War, it's a pretty big, story so i'm looking at i'm just again just opening up a wikipedia page i don't know who the author who wrote the opening paragraph but it says right here it says due to the ferocity of the chinese attack and the heroism of the defenders that a battle has also been called don't know by whom one of the greatest regimental defense actions in military history yep. so my first question is why the battle and you're saying well here's why because it's awesome and we should study it right but i guess my second question is why not? Like, why is this not in the list? Why is this not with the Battle of Agincourt, with the uh, Battle of uh, Gettysburg? Or Gettysburg? Yeah, why right. isn't it? Uh, it's like I said, it's because it's in a forgotten conflict, and ultimately, I think that's what drives that. Uh, but you know, to kind of put it in perspective, you have a regiment, the Twenty Third Regimental Combat Team, under the command of Colonel Paul Freeman. Uh, it's 4,500 troops uh, in the regimental combat team, and it gets surrounded by as many as eight Chinese regiments. So one regiment surrounded by eight Chinese regiments. That's a lot. And yeah. the one regiment wins. Handily, I might add. Yeah, I'm going go to ha go ahead and have to, like... I'm going to have to hear this. Yeah, I'm going to have so, to hear, like, if you're surrounding someone, that's that's rule number one. Penetrate right. and or surround. One or the other. Penetrate and divide or surround. And, and you win. Yep. Yeah. And what happened was, I mean, to kind of put in how lopsided ultimately the victory was, uh, the UN force, and the reason why I say UN forces is because that, the United Nations was, it was under their mandate. 
uh, now granted, most of your senior officers were U.S. because we were contributing the majority of the combat power in the conflict. But in this particular case, with the 23rd Infantry Regiment, it really was a U.N. regiment. And the reason why is because inside this regiment, there was a French infantry battalion attached to this regiment. So oh. it really was a U.N. force. It was, you know, it was a standard U.S. infantry regiment, three infantry battalions, U.S., uh, an artillery battalion, uh, an air defense battery, an engineer company. But then there was this random French battalion nice. that got attached to it. And the reason why it got attached was it was under the command of uh, Lieutenant Colonel Raoul Monclar, who was actually a three-star general in the French Army. And he was uh, he had was part of the Free French. He served under de Gaulle, uh, did not you know, fight for Vichy during the Second World War. He had always stayed with the Free French. And he felt like he was so embarrassed by France's performance in the Second World War. He's like, mm. we have to, we got to rectify it. And so when the Korean War kicked off, he was like, I'm going to raise a, a battalion and we're going to fight for the UN against the communists. We're going to go win some trophies. And so what happened was when he raised this battalion, and by the way, it was a battalion completely full of volunteers. So, really? So, yeah, you got some motivation automatically. Right. And so, like, one company in the battalion was, you know, Foreign Legion. One company was French Marines. One fun company was, like, French paratroopers. Mm. So you're really talking, like, probably, like, the cream of the crop of the French Army was in this battalion. And he was told, hey, if you're going to be in this battalion, you can't be a three-star general. You're going to be a lieutenant colonel. And he was like, I don't care. I want to go fight communists. So Let's go fight. Yeah, one of these guys. So, okay. So... It was interesting. So you have this three-star general who's now a lieutenant colonel under the command of a U.S. colonel, uh, and that was Colonel Paul Freeman. He was the regimental commander. And when the French battalion showed up, people were like, I don't, I don't want a French battalion. And, you know, what am I going to do that with That whole these perception guys? of yeah. French. That, and, uh, <laughs> that French thing again, it keeps coming up. Colonel Paul Freeman was like, an extra infantry battalion? Yeah, I'll take it. And so that's how they ended up getting attached uh, to the 23rd Regimental Combat Team, and and so they're part of that. Uh, they're part of that myth when you talk about the Tomahawks, which is the 23rd Regiment's. You know, they're the Tomahawks. That's who they call themselves. Uh, that French battalion is still very much a part of that story. Mm. Um, so why you know why is it such a big deal? Uh, as I mentioned, we were winning the Korean War. October happens. We cross the Yalu. Excuse me. Not wait, Yalu. wait, wait. 1951? Is that's closer to the beginning. Though. Right. So 1950, October, we cross the 30th parallel, not the Yalu River. So we'll correct that. But we're heading to the Yalu River. And the Chinese, uh, Mao Zedong is still in charge of China, isn't too keen on having, you know, an unfriendly country, the United States, so close to his border. And he starts talking to Stalin and Joseph Stalin. And he's like, we got to do something about this. We don't want to have, you know, U S forces this close to close to China. And as the U S forces get closer to closer to the Yalu, which is the border between North Korea and China, he finally devises a plan to, you know, push the Americans back. And if best case scenario, push the Americans off the Korean peninsula. Uh, so the first phase, and the Chinese call it first phase, second phase, third phase offensives, really original names. <laughs> so first phase offensive. I mean, it makes sense. Yeah. I mean, uh, first phase offensive was in October, and it really was kind of, this is your last chance. You know, if you keep on pushing, you're going to eventually face, you know, the might of the Chinese. Incur the wrath. Right. Um, and MacArthur ignores it, to his detriment, by the way. And he keeps on telling... Uh, Washington, that ah, the Chinese aren't really a big problem, even though his guys on the ground are like, no, they're, they're you know. how many guys are on the ground right now? Uh, like, how big is this conflict at this point in time? Well, I mean, for us, we're probably talking in the United States, you're probably talking nine or ten divisions tops. So it's right, it's, fully engaged. Right, yeah, no, it's not one or two divisions, it's several. This cores. is not near the start where it's like, hey, is this going to happen? This is yeah. happening, there's a war, right. there's There's things going on. On a, on a large war scale. Right. And there are, like I said, there are several U.S. Corps. It's an army. It's 8th yep. Army. 
And uh, so they're pushing north. October, first phase offensive happens. Uh, and then MacArthur's like, no, we're just going to keep on going. We're going to go all the way to Yalu. We're going to completely reunite the Korean Peninsula. Where's that river? That's that's the border right. between China and Korea. Yep, so it's north, really far north. And it gets really cold in the winter there. Yeah, so is, the, he wants to go all the way through North you Korea. You go, go all the way. So November comes, and we're getting close to Thanksgiving. So November 25th, the Chinese second phase offensive, is, and this is the big one, uh, counterattacks across the Yalu. And we're estimating on the Chinese side, quarter of a million men. Mm. So it is... Pretty big force. A pretty, pretty big, pretty big force, and it completely catches the UN forces flat-footed, and the United States and the UN retreat pell-mell. Just get out of there. And it's called the Great Bug Out. In fact, that's the term they use. Oh, and hmm. it's actually the longest U.S. retreat in U.S. military history, in terms of just the actual physical distance of miles. And so December, no, that's not it. November and December of 1950. Battle of the Chung Chung Chosen Reservoir. Chung Chung River. Yep, Chung Chung River, Chosen Reservoir. Uh all that happens uh in November and December of, of 1950. Uh and the US forces have to so we lose Pongyang, Pongyang, which you know we had captured. Chinese recapture Pyongyang and they're heading south and there's this kind of like we are getting beaten by an army this is the Chinese army that they don't really have much of an air force uh, they have a mishmash of weapons like they got numbers they do and one of the reasons why they were so successful is partly because of their uh, obsolescence they're not a mechanized army okay and so Everything is brought on the backs of their soldiers. That's their supply line. So they're marching. Right. They're And well, what they're doing is... Marching, marching. They're infiltrating uh, using the mountains, the Tybeck mountain range. And so because they are not dependent on the roads, because they're not a mechanized army, they don't need fuel and all that kind of stuff, they literally infiltrate through the mountains. And in doing so, they actually get behind UN lines because the UN forces, mechanized army, they're pretty much going to be road bound in terms of where they set up their defensive positions. They always need to have roads. And the Chinese literally, like I said, they carry most of their supplies on the back of their soldiers. They have like several bags of rice. Uh, and that's how they resupply. And in doing so, they're because of their, their tactics, they get in behind UN lines. And then what ends up happening is when they initiate their attacks, uh, they basically use the UN forces against them. They'll hit it like a choke point and a mountain pass. And as the UN forces are falling back, they'll basically destroy a tank. Put, put this on perspective of time. Because when you say it out loud, it's like, oh yeah, they started here and then they moved through the mountains. Like that wasn't a day. No, this is, is this weeks the, 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 of the, movement? The second phase was basically, like I said, end of November, uh, middle of December. So about a month. Um, but yeah, no, the Chinese, that was the other thing. They were able to move their forces get them into place uh, over a period of weeks. And then all of a sudden this, you know, huge counteroffensive kicks off and it's like, wait a minute, the Chinese are behind. How did they get behind us? Well, they're walking <laughs> and, and, and they're using the mountains uh, and they're also moving at night. And so the Chinese are one of the first uh, adversaries that we face that are like, I am not going to fight the United States during the day. That's stupid. Because the U.S. has got air power, they've got really well-developed artillery doctrine, that's a really dumb idea. So I'm going to fight the U.S. at night. And so they do most of their combat actions at night. And one of the ways they, like, they have like different signal techniques, they use bugles, whistles, and that's how they communicate um, during the battles. Like, you know, three bugle blasts. Yeah, I remember, I remember seeing the beginning of, um, what was it, We Were Soldiers, in that, and they were, there was... The Korean War was how it opened with the bugles. And then it was like, you know, 15 years later. Oh, no, uh, that, that was the French in Vietnam. But you're right. I yeah, mean, it's, it's, it's still bugle similar. calls yeah. being used as, as 
methods for battlefield communication. And so they, they get behind the UN lines. The UN forces retreat Palmel south of the 38th parallel. How many? How many UN forces? Yeah, this is a big, yeah, this is a big, so well, this is thousands whole, and thousands. Yeah, this is the whole 8th Army. Oh, so they're just backing up. They're yeah, just, they. this is where you have the story of the 1st Marine Division, the Chosen Reservoir, because the 1st Marines have to basically battle their way out because the Chinese have gotten behind them. So the 1st Marines have to basically battle their way out to get down to the port of Hong Kong and get out of there. So is this predominantly a delay maneuver as well? They're shooting backwards as they're moving? I mean, like, yeah, it's 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 a huge retrograde. So there's so there skirmishes right. and fights. and yeah. It's not just, oh, they're coming, back it up. No. They're like, oh, they're engaging us, back it up. Still engaging, back it they up. Had to fight, yeah, they had to fight their way out. Like 2ID, 2nd Infantry Division, uh, had to basically fight its way out. And in doing so, uh, the 38th Infantry Regiment and the 9th Infantry Regiment got completely torn up. Um to the point where you could say the division itself, all of 2ID was no longer an effective fighting force because really they only had one regimental infantry combat team left that was in So tact. doctrinally, it was destroyed. Yeah. It was... Yeah, it was, it was, it was beat up pretty badly. Uh, the 23rd Infantry Regiment was really the only one that had any, any significant combat power left. Ironically, and one of the reasons why is because Colonel Freeman was like, I'm not going down that route. I'm going to go down this route. <laughs> and because he's like, that's a bad idea. And he goes down this other route. Was it terrain analysis or was yeah, that like he it. heard, got word? Yeah, no, it was part of it was terrain analysis. Uh, so, so yeah, third phase offensive is in January. And that's where uh, the Chinese actually recapture Seoul. So we lose Seoul, we recapture Seoul, and now we've lost Seoul again. Got it. And... And, oh, but wait, there's more. Uh, the 8th Army commander, a guy by the name of General Walton Walker, one of those weird quirks of history, driving in a Jeep, Jeep gets into an accident, he dies. Oh, of course. So, Probably had a mustache, too. Um, who knows? Uh, so all of a sudden, we got to get a new commander in, okay? And Walton Walker was not a bad commander. In fact, he was, he was actually a pretty decent commander. But the guy that replaces him is a war winner, okay? The guy that replaces him is General Matthew Ridgway. You might have heard of him. I've heard that. Yeah. Yep. He was uh, the 18th Airborne War commander in the Second World War, mm. okay? Uh, originally was the commander of the 82nd Airborne and then 18th Airborne Corps commander. And now he gets appointed to command the 8th Army, all right? And he immediately shows up, and it's like a shot in the arm, you know, a shot of adrenaline. Oh, it's go time. Right. Uh. Uh, walks around. He's got hand grenades in his suspenders. Let's know. go, boys! Yeah, he's very much a gung ho type guy, and almost immediately he gets he develops a rapport with the the Joes, like the, a General McManus right, kind of. With the common with the common soldiers, there's all kinds of stories of soldiers on the front lines, miserable, cold, and all of a sudden they turn around and there's General Ridgeway in the foxhole with them. <laughs> you know? So, so I guess. M more people might be familiar with, I, I said General McManus, the fictional right. uh, Brad Pitt character, but General McChrystal. Yeah. Uh, in more recent times. Or, you know, uh, General Schwarzkopf. I mean, he's. Yeah, Schwarzkopf. Yeah, yeah he's, he is larger than life and he makes an instant impact. And he's basically like, we got to change our tactics. All right. The Chinese move in the mountains and they're getting behind our lines by moving to the mountains. So guess what? Everyone get off the roads. Yeah. You're going to move in the mountains too, just like the Chinese do. And initially some units are like, I don't know, you know, a lot of these guys, like you were talking about, a lot of these guys were literally on reserve status because of World War II. And then they're like, oh man, I got just pulled back to active duty. Uh, uh, and a sucks. lot of guys that happened to guys who had, you know, thought they had done their time. And now, Hey, now I'm in Korea. It's just, man, it's and, Sometimes it's weird to think about that in today's yeah. climate, but and so that was the that was what happened then. Yep, and but one of the units that really kind of took that to heart was Colonel Freeman's Twenty Third Infantry Regiment. He's like, yeah, you're right. We got to, you know, got to fight in the hills with the French. The French are included right. at this time now. And okay. so, and in, what ends up happening is uh, they almost get singled out because Ridgeway literally starts seeing this one regiment. And mind you, you know, he's the Eighth Army Commander, so he's Several echelons above. Yeah, he's that. got dozens of regiments. Right. And so, first, there's the Battle of Twin Tunnels, which happens on February 1st. Twin Tunnels is basically a movement to contact. 
because what ends up happening is because the Chinese are not mechanized, it's very easy for the UN forces to pull away once they get out of contact and the Chinese can't just hop on the trucks and go, right. They can't effectively pursue them because they don't have trucks. And so once you know, the UN forces can break contact. It's, yeah, we can't catch up to them. Outside of maximum effective right. range, basically. You know, we're literally walking. Um, <laughs> and so what ends up happening is is that there's literally like a big, huge, you know, no man's land. And there's a point where in early February, late January, like where really, where is the Chinese front, you know, front line and where's our front line? And so on February 1st, he, uh, you know, the second ID commander, uh, Major General Ruffner orders 23rd Infantry Regiment to basically do a large movement to contact. We got to figure out. Go and find them. Right. Go figure Where them out. And now, 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 mind you, this is this is still at a time where lines are important right. for effectively fighting a war right. or a battle. Like, we need to know where that line right. is. And so they move north. They run into the Chinese at Twin Tunnels. And there's a, you know, a decent-sized battle. Uh, and... But they're like, hey, we found the Chinese. They're right here. Mission accomplished. <laughs> yeah. Damn. And so they start getting ready. And Ridgeway, one of the things, you know, Ridgeway is known for is when he shows up at 8th Army headquarters, he's like, where's, where's your offensive plans? And the 8th Army headquarters staff is like, we don't have any offensive plans. He's like, you got no plans for attack? And they're like, no. And Ridgeway's like, that's wrong. We we're going to start going on the attack. Again, from from my perspective of a modern... American. Right. That seems weird. You know. Like to not have an attack plan. Right. Like always have an attack plan. And so he starts to try to turn all that around. Uh, Is this because, like, is it because, like, my modern mindset is because of stuff like this? Where it's like. It's partly because of that. I also think that when the Chinese attacked in November, it was really kind of, you know, it's like a punch in the face. And it was like, oh, my gosh, you know. These guys are not these, you know, third world, you know. Pushovers. Yeah. yeah. They're kicking our butt. And so the pendulum was kind of swung in the opposite direction. Oh, my God, they're supermen. And Overreaction. Right. And he was kind of like, no, you know, you know, we just go back to what works, go back to our doctrine, and we're, we're going to go on the attack. And so you have Operation Thunderbolt, Operation Roundup. These are very small operations, but they're basically probing attacks to figure out what's going on with the Chinese lines. Uh, meanwhile, simultaneously, the Chinese are planning for their fourth phase offensive. Very genius name. Right. And that <laughs> kicks off uh, in, you know, basically the February, you know, early February. And at this point in the war, the Chinese have learned some things. You know, they're, they're adapting, they're adjusting just like we are. And one of the things they figure out is, okay, attacking UN units, or basically US units mostly, but there are like some British units and some other units, that's not going to get us a lot of traction. We're not going to win fights. But the lines are so spread out, it can't all be US units. So there's actually Korean units, Republic of Korea units, also on the front lines. I seem to remember hearing about this idea somewhere, like a documentary somewhere. And so the Chinese are like, we're going to hit those units because they're not as well trained. They don't have the same level of esprit de corps. And a lot, like I said, a lot of them are haphazard kind of thrown together units. Their combat effectiveness is not very good. And they're also, I don't know if there's anything to do with it, but they're also fighting Koreans. Right. And so. Like Koreans fighting or Koreans, do they want to? Is this, uh, like was, how much was South Korea at this time, like really, really, really very much like. We want to actively stop the spread of communism. And how much was the UN saying, this is where it's happening and we're going to do it in your country? Um, no, I think, especially as you got later on in the war, and it was really just a level of training. Yeah, but this is still the first year right. of the war. So, yeah, no, they were still, they just weren't fighting very well. But there was definitely a, we want to, you know, we don't want to go communist. So it's, this is our fight. Right. They, they still, yeah. it's, okay. And by this point, most of the units, there were North Korean units, but in a lot of cases, you had South Koreans fighting Chinese units. And if you know anything about that history, there is some, some animosity. Things that are very foreign to us as Westerners, they're like, oh, well, you know, everyone gets... And they're like, no. <laughs> we don't get along. There's things, yeah. Right. Uh, so, fourth phase offensive kicks off, and 
they hit some of these uh, Korean units and they break through. This is the Chinese, okay? They're off and running. They've penetrated uh, the United Nations lines. And General Almond, who is the Corps commander, this is 10th Corps, so one of the 8th Army's Corps, he's like, we're going to pull back. We're going to pull back. Everyone pull back because we don't want to get units surrounded again like they had back in you know November and December. We want to avoid that uh, you know trap again. And he issues that order to 10th, uh, to t- Second Infantry Division, and this is where it gets interesting. And that same day, which I believe would have been like February, uh, February eleventh, yeah, February eleventh. So this is. I'm just looking at the, uh, this is close to the battle. This is close to the right. battle of uh, Chipione. Yeah, because, yeah, Chipione is 13th to the 15th of February. So this is right there. Yeah. So 11th of February, this is when the fourth phase offensive kicks off. Uh, and Ullman orders everyone to fall back. General Ridgeway literally tells uh, the 23rd Regimental Combat Team. So you have 8th Army Commander ordering... A regimental combat team. So he's basically three, f- technically four echelons. You know, he's skipping the corps commander. He's skipping the division commander. He's going right down to the regimental commander. And he's like, you are not retreating. Colonel Freeman, you are staying at this town. So Chip Yongi was important because it was a road junction. I was going to ask why that yeah, town. Yeah. yeah. Um, very similar to Bastogne and a lot of those other places. It's a road junction. There's a lot of roads. That very similar there. to battles we've heard of. Right. Uh, <laughs> and... And he'd already seen the performance of the 23rd Infantry Regiment because of the Battle of Twin Tunnels, you know, the battle that was a couple of weeks prior to that. So he's like, I know these guys are going to fight. They're going to do what they tell them to do. And what Ridgeway is trying to achieve is he wants to, he knows he can't compete with the Chinese manpower wise. The Chinese are always going to have a lot more guys. It's just, that's just going to be the way it is. What he wants to do is he knows he's got a lot more firepower than the Chinese. And so he's like, I want to use my firepower. Direct and indirect. Right. Everything. To cancel out your manpower. All right. The problem is you want to fight at night. This is the Chinese. And I don't want to fight at night. I want to still fight during the day. You didn't really have, you know, what we have today in terms of wheel in the night. That really wasn't a thing in, in 1951. So he's like, I'm going to give the Chinese an offer they can't refuse. I'm going to put this infantry regiment. He's going to bait them? Yep. <laughs> That's exactly what he does. And they're going to go after these guys. Look at this nice, juicy regiment and, here. And, and because it's a road network, it's a road hub, it, they can't bypass them. The, the, they, they have to take this road hub. What is that for supplies? Because like you said, they're moving through the mountains and stuff. Yeah. No, it, the, you know, it, it's just... You got to get your trains. Right, it still facilitates movement. And, and like I said, it's... He's literally handing this regimental combat team out on a silver platter Jeez. that the Chinese are like, well, maybe we can take these guys this out. This is like a defensive feint almost. Yeah. <laughs> and they had, and the Chinese had had some, some success. So you had Task Force Faith, which was the 7th Infantry Division regimental combat team that was destroyed uh, in December during the um, second phase offensive. So this is something that the Chinese had done before. And they're like, part two, we're going to do it again. 23rd Infantry Regiment. And so that's what happens. They, they, you know, Colonel Freeman gets a chip young knee and sets up a perimeter 360 degrees. And he knows, hey, the Chinese are going to attack. I'm going to get surrounded. And my job is to basically hold out as long as I can. And that way we can then bring in UN air power, UN artillery. And we're basically going to obliterate you know, the Chinese. Now, now I know colonels like to write. Right. Did he write like a journal or a, um, a you know, a battle damage or an after action review where he's um, like, hey, we were expecting to die or like what? So, because we're at the battle now. It's right. about to happen. He knows he's going to get surrounded. What do you mean by three? First question is, did we know what the disposition, like the mental disposition of the soldiers were? Were they expecting to die? Is this like an no, Alamo thing? No. Or they're like excited because we, we are the anvil that the hammer will smash on um he had by this point uh he had a and this is also important from a leadership perspective if you ever want to do like leadership papers colonel freeman is definitely you know his men had the utmost faith in him 
because he had served, he had saved them uh, back in f- November of 1950 uh, during the second phase offensive. So his men knew that he was not going to throw away their lives, you know, needlessly. And so they were like, this guy's going to get us home. Yes, we're going to get surrounded. And he was never, you know, filling them with lies. He's like, yeah, check it out. We're going to get surrounded. Here's the plan. And our job is to basically hold out, kill as many of these, you know, Chinese soldiers as we can. And then eventually we're going to get, you know, eventually we're going to get relieved uh, by other forces. So this is 1951. Mm -hmm. When you say 360 security, porcupine face out, what does that look like? Are they digging trenches? Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, they're digging foxholes. Uh, and so you literally have... Camouflage. As much as they can. But, yeah, it's it's an actual area defense. Okay. Uh, you've got, you know, if you look at it, and it's a 360-degree perimeter. So the northern half of the perimeter would have been 1st Battalion. The eastern half of the perimeter would have been 3rd Battalion. The southern half of the perimeter would have been... Uh, second battalion, and then the western half of the perimeter was the French battalion. I feel like this is uh, you did OCS, right? Yep. You still you still did the like the sticks lanes for platoon sticks lanes where you you stop for that. You got to build the patrol base. Yeah. And it's just three sixty. You got yeah. crew served weapons in the corners. So yep. I feel like that's what you're describing, like a like a like a an actual circle, guns facing out. And, uh, yep. Okay. Circle. Yep. yep. <laughs> there you go. And so, yeah, they 360 degrees. One of the things that was interesting was he actually chose to go in the valley. And he knew, you know, when the Chinese surround, they're going to have the high ground. But the reason why he did that. <laughs> the high ground is important. Right. Is if he had tried to take the high ground, he would have been spread too far out. And so he made a conscious decision like, I can't, as much as I want to take that high ground, if I do that, I'm going to have gaps in my lines. And I can't have gaps. I got to have literally very tight. Lines and I I just hear low ground and I just, I just think Corongal Valley right well yeah similar and so and this is also the interesting thing about how the Chinese fight and how the Americans fight in terms of uh, risk assessments in terms of uh, acceptability in terms of casualties so the battle kicks off the night of the thirteenth okay so twenty two hundred hours fighting at night again right twenty two hundred hours. Uh, the Chinese start prepping the battlefield with mortar fire. Because remember, they're light infantry. They're not going to be bringing like super duper heavy 155s. It's like 60 millimeter mortars, 81 millimeter mortars, maybe 120 millimeter mortars, but you're not going to be seeing these large caliber artillery pieces. It's tough to carry 120. Right? <laughs> uh, but they would. But I mean, that was basically the highest caliber you're going to get for the most part. Uh, and so... 2200, 10 p.m. at night, they start prepping the battlefield with indirect fire. And then at 2300, 11 o'clock at night, uh, they attack from Hill 397. Now, Hill 397 is to the southeast, and it's the highest point that overlooks uh, the, uh, the, US, the, the U.S. positions. And the Chinese have Hill 397. So Big Hill? Yeah, well, 397 meters. Well, I mean, is it, yeah. a, is it a large spaced out hill where you can put like an entire battalion on a side of it? it? Yeah, it's pretty big. It's a pretty significant terrain feature. And so the Chinese attack from Hill 397 and they're basically hitting 2nd Battalion and 3rd Battalion. So they're hitting the east side of the perimeter and the south side of the perimeter. And then at the same time, a little bit after, about 10, 15 minutes after midnight, they hit the French Battalion in the west. Now, all of these attacks, for the most part, are just probing attacks, okay? Um, now, to a guy on the ground, they're like, no, I see a lot of... <laughs> there's a lot of bullets coming my yeah, way. Yeah, there's a lot, and a lot of guys coming my way. Uh, but for the Chinese, all they're trying to do is to figure out where there's a weakness in the perimeter. And they are literally throwing bodies to figure out where these weaknesses to are. To the tune of, like, 100 dead... A, a thousand lot. dead in a yeah. sally. So, well, I mean, I think, ulti- like I said, ultimately, I think it was like two, 2,000 killed in action in the three-day period Jeez. for the Chinese. Killed. Yeah. And then 3,000 wounded in action. Uh. So, so yeah. So, that's going on. And then at around 2 o'clock in the morning, there's a much larger attack in the south up against G Company. 
And what ends up happening from that, that attack is the Chinese figure out that that southern portion of the line is probably the weakest point. Okay. But it's going to be daylight soon. So they're like, time out. We're going to have to wait till. Not fighting during yeah, the day. We're gonna, what advantage do they have at night? Is it literally just because they know they have the numbers and at night they can just swarm or something? Well, so What, what one, advantage do they have? Yeah, so one, uh, you don't have really effective close air support. For, oh, okay, so they're accepting the tactical risk. The night degrades U.S. forces. They don't get any advantage, but it degrades U.S. Right. forces such that the relative combat power right. is more equalized. Right, exactly. Got it. Okay. And it's obviously harder to you know shoot artillery. Uh, ironically enough, one of the things that the U.S. starts to do is they'll fly C-47 sky trains, which are basically transport aircraft, over Chip Yongni, and they start just dropping flares to illuminate the battlefield, to basically keep the entire battlefield you know, illuminated. It's still not good enough for good, effective close air support. There is some close air support at night, but it's nowhere going to, it's not like what we see today where it's, you know, as good as it is during the day. Yeah, we can fly at night, no problem. Right. Uh, So daylight comes and the attack ceases uh, at around 7.30 in the morning. Okay, that's pretty much when, hey, time out, pause. All right. You still see some desultory (laughs) artillery fire. And this is important. One of the rounds, it's a mortar round, actually hits near the regimental CP, and Colonel Freeman is injured. Not severely, okay, but he is injured. And uh, he's like, I'm not, you know, I'm not leaving. Um, any any indication that was a targeted, we, they knew where the CP was, so they're trying to hit it? Uh, probably. I mean, you know, there's a lot of tents, you know, probably. You know. But this is in a town. Couldn't they be like in a house or something? Yeah, they were actually... Yeah, they were actually in a building. Uh, part of the building uh, was where the CP was. But, I mean, it's also such a small area. How big is the area? Uh, probably, at most, a mile and a half wide. Oh, so this is not... I guess a regiment, that's yeah. the frontage of that is... Yeah. Regimental frontage... Well, remember, nowadays... It's, it's circled. Right. So... Yeah, nowadays, a regimental frontage would be like 15 kilometers... Uh, so, but this is surrounded. The frontage is the perimeter. Yeah. So if you're yeah. talking a mile, a mile, a mile, a mile, you're already at the perimeter is probably. Yeah. So four. Yeah. It's about a four and a half mile perimeter, five, five and a half mile. Uh, so yeah, it'd be pretty close to over 10 kilometers. Yeah. Yeah. So anyways, so he gets injured, uh, but he refuses to get you know, evac out. But eventually he does get evac out because he, his Core command, the core commander, not the division commander, is like, we're not keeping you there. <laughs> we're gonna pull you out. He gets pulled out uh, on the next day. The morning. I just I see that pic that we were soldiers seen right. again, where they're like, he's like, I am in the middle of a firefight. Yeah, it's basically <laughs> that, you know. And Freeman refuses to get evac'd. Uh, and by the way, what's interesting, Korea's really the first time you start to see helicopters, and so there are helicopters coming in, um, you know, mash, you know, that kind of a thing. Uh, but yeah, he refuses to get evac'd out. Doesn't actually get evac'd out t- for another 24 hours until the morning of the 15th. And it's the evening of the 14th and the 15th is where it's game on. This is where the previous night, the Chinese have figured out after all these probing attacks where the weak points are. And then on the night of the 14th and the 15th, this is where decisive operation, we're going to hit in the south and we're going to try to penetrate uh, the UN lines uh from the south. And would you say there were six or eight? Eight regiments. Eight Chinese regiments. Right. That's a lot. Yep. <laughs> so what and what ends up happening is is you get this situation. So what actually gets hit, okay? So initially the Chinese start doing their attacks uh at around 1 30 in the morning of the 15th. Okay. Actually, excuse me, right around midnight. They hit uh the north side of the perimeter, okay. But that's really just um, a feint to fix forces on the north side of the perimeter. So it's Alpha Company and then Charlie Company, all right, or Able Company, but that's what they called it back then. And what happens then is then at around 2 o'clock in the morning, they hit the eastern side of the perimeter. So Item Company, uh, L Company, okay. They don't get a word? Would have been... L would have been Lima still. So, okay. Yeah. Uh, and then 
as you get closer and closer to three o'clock, that's when the main attack comes in and it hits G company in the South, in the South golf company. And what you end up having is, uh, you've got literally a platoon, uh, Lieutenant McGee's third platoon. Um, they are hit by several battalions. Okay. <laughs> One platoon gets attacked by several battalions and, Gets attacked in 1951. They're predominantly using what's their hand weapon? Is it a semi automatic so, or bolt action? Interestingly enough, that's a good question because the Chinese have not, they're a third world country at this point. There's no industry, not much. We're still using M1 Grands. Like, what are and we using? So, here? what the Chinese are using is whatever they can get their hands on. Okay. So, they are actually using uh, captured weapons from Japan from the second world war. So bolt action, you know, rifles from, uh, the Japanese seven Imperial, rounds, you know, Imperial Japanese army. Uh, they're using M one Garands that they've actually captured 10 from, rounds, uh, eight rounds, uh, that they've actually captured from UN forces. Uh, they are getting some submachine guns from the Russians at this point, from the Soviets. So Pishka 41 submachine guns, the big things with the round. Yeah. Yeah. 60 rounds. Yep. Um, I'm just imagining a battalion and how many rounds they have and their, you know, rate of fire, like one platoon. I mean, that's that. Okay. So what else? They so, uh, a Tommy gun. Right. So for the Americans, Americans are still using the M one grand at this point. Uh, some guys still have Thompson submachine guns. Some guys still have running automatic rifles from a small arms perspective. It's really no different from what we had in the second world war. Okay. Um, so the Chinese come charging in horns blowing whistles blowing. Then they got these guys and this is kind of a crazy job. The satchel charge guys. Oh, okay. And all they're yeah, carrying, yeah, yeah. they're not even carrying a weapon other than a big long pole with a satchel charge on the end. That's all they're carrying. They got nothing else. Jeez. And their job was basically to run up and basically get under the wire the C wire and plop the satchel charge into the foxhole. And then of course the thing would go off and you know, you have enough of those guys. Some are getting through. Yeah. Some are going to get through. And ultimately uh, they do at around three fifteen, despite everything that Lieutenant McKee does. And by the way, he survives, he doesn't die, but most of his platoon kind of stinks because most of his platoon is pretty much wiped out to a man. Uh, the Chinese break through at that point, and now they're pushing in. They're now inside the perimeter, and they actually reach uh, one of the artillery batteries that are, you know, on the south side of the perimeter. And so now it's, oh, man, they're inside the perimeter. We got a counterattack. The farthest they can get from the perimeter is, what, half a mile? If it's only a mile deep, you know, any. Right. So they penetrate through. Um, they're in the perimeter. So immediately... Colonel Freeman's like, we got a counterattack because that's kind of what you do. You're like, hey, we got to reseal this perimeter, kick the Chinese out. And they have one of the earliest uh, ranger companies. There are ranger companies, but they're kind of ad hoc at this point. Um, so there's this ranger company that was attached to the 23rd Infantry Regiment. They're not part of like 2nd Ranger Battalion. They're just literally like, we got this ranger company, you know. And these guys counterattack and initially they have some success. They push the Chinese back off uh, the perimeter, but then at daybreak and shortly after daybreak, the Chinese counterattack. Keep forgetting again. this is all happening at night. Right. So around six o'clock in the morning, the Chinese counterattack again, and it's awful. It's hand to hand, you know, guys, bayonets, E tools. It's that kind of, you know, awful hand to hand combat. Not even enough time to reload. So you're melee right. at this point. And so they then, Push the Americans back, okay? So now it's the morning of the 15th. The Chinese are actually, they own, they control a part of the southern perimeter, okay? And so now it's like, well, that counterattack, which, by the way, was very ad hoc. It was just kind of like hasty counterattack. Do this and see if right. it works. So now they're like, we got to do another one. And there's a little bit more planning, and they're going to kick it off at 12 o'clock, in the morning. So to paint the picture, this this battlefield is so small. Like that means there's 
probably Chinese sitting in the formerly uh, yes. US, American foxholes, looking a whopping half a mile north. Not yeah. even probably. Well, yeah, half mile would be the division. I mean, the regimental headquarters. And yeah. like, there's American colonels, captains, right. lieutenants. Like, okay, here's what we need to do here, and they're literally like right over there. Yep. Yep. Nice. So, okay. uh, now what ends up happening is the lines kind of reform. So basically, the Americans are on the next ridge over. So yes, the Chinese have broken through. But it's not a, a, an, a it's not ultimately a successful penetration. They can't really exploit because the U.S. have reestablished a perimeter north of there. So it's like it was an oval. Now it's like a kidney bean. Right. Yeah. Uh, but the U.S. is like we're going to push them back off, um, and we're going to have this uh, attack at twelve noon, and it's going to be a an organized company size attack, and they basically pull a company from the northern side of the perimeter because they're like nothing's happening on the north side we can pull a company off and these guys are going to do the counterattack at noon. And it was a, it was a Baker company uh, does the counterattack. So at noon Baker company steps off and it immediately doesn't go anywhere. Why noon? Oh, cool. Just cause pick a time. Yeah. It's a good time. Yep. But as I mentioned, now you can start bringing in air power, artillery. And that by the way is starting to come in. Uh, you start to see air power um, pretty much almost, you know, at daylight. And one of the things that the U.S. uses. <laughs> Where's the artillery in place? It's it, literally in the center of the perimeter. No, no, no. Oh, wait. So there's no support artillery from the from the division. No. They're, no. They're, they're, so they're that far away. Yeah. Yep. Oh. So, uh, but they have a lot of artillery. They have, like I said, they have a whole battalion of artillery and then they have an additional battery of artillery in this perimeter. So you're talking 30 something guns, a lot of guns. And because they're at the center of the perimeter, they can basically range out, turn this way and yeah. that way. And uh, so, but the air force starts showing up and the air force has this relatively new, they just started using it at the end of world war two, but Korea is really where they, is it still the army air corps? No, it's the U S air force by this nice. point. It's napalm. Oh, and so they just start dropping napalm willy-nilly okay and because and this goes back to ridgeway's original plan now he's got the chinese they're fighting in the daylight okay so i know where they're at i can see them and now i can bring my air force in and i can drop all this ordnance on their forces and it yeah <laughs> it devastates them it, it's it's an emotional event <laughs> uh, but wait there's more Okay, <laughs> so now we're going to relieve the 23rd Regimental Combat Team. So we put together uh, from 1st Cavalry Division, uh, Task Force Crombez, which is a armored column. Okay, so now it's primarily tanks. And they're going to come up uh, from the south, and they're going to basically break through the Chinese lines and relieve the 23rd Infantry Regiment. They so, got to wait for the napalm to stop burning? Or, yeah, I guess. <laughs> I mean, it's kind of a bit, like I've seen it, it can burn for yeah. a long time. So that happens. So they step off uh, from the town of Coxeri, which is several kilometers south. And oh, by the way, they do actually move up their artillery as well. So okay. now you're starting to get artillery from not just inside the perimeter, but from outside the perimeter. And they step off around 345 and this, by the way, is not a long fight. Uh, it basically takes them about 45 minutes to an hour for this column to start and then to break through the Chinese lines and, and relieve uh, the 23rd Regimental Combat Team. It's kind of a very controversial action because you're like, well, they, it was successful. Yes, they did. They broke through the Chinese lines, and it really was kind of... The last straw. The Chinese are all of a sudden like, we're getting hit by napalm. There's a lot of artillery. More artillery. Yeah, more artillery. And now there's 20 tanks showing up. <laughs> and and they don't have tanks. They're all infantry. Right. And it's Chinese, all light infantry. Yeah. And the Chinese are like, ah, we're done. You know. Uh, and basic, and it's the first time in the war that you see a, a Chinese route, where the Chinese are routed. They're literally retreating pell-mell, running up into the hills, literally. 
and the battle's over with. So to- an actual retreat like you right. see in the movies. Right. It's a complete and total rout. Uh, but what's interesting about Task Force Krombez, it's obviously under the command of a Colonel Marcel Krombez. He is a guy with a chip on his shoulder. Okay. He's very different from Colonel Freeman. Um, men aren't too fond of him. Uh, the guys that serve underneath him. And he's also kind of a glory hound. Okay. And so mm. he's like, we're going to do this column of tanks. Does he pursue? And well, he's, his mission is just to basically break through the perimeter. I know okay. what his mission is, but it's, I've also met glory hounds. Right. No, his, he doesn't do that. Okay. But what he does though, is it's, it's, uh, it's two companies of tank, one company of infantry. Okay. And the way the MTO was back then, first cavalry division did not have half tracks. So the infantry are literally riding on the tanks. Okay. They're not riding in trucks or half tracks. They're on the tanks. And the plan was, okay, if we start taking fire, you guys are going to get off the tank and you're going to push out and push these uh, Chinese forces back. And then you're going to get back on the tanks and then we're going to keep on going. That's not what happens. <laughs> okay. So sure enough, as there, and by the way, it's, it is pretty good territory for infantry because you got the mountains, the it's a single road, they have the high ground, they're kind of shooting down. And the biggest problem that the Chinese have is their best anti-tank weapons still only have a range of about 300 meters. And the 50 cals on the tank can shoot much farther than that. But And at a sustained rate of right. fire. So, but, you know, the Chinese are like, we're going to give it a college try and we're going to start attacking. So the tanks stop, infantry dismounts, pushes the Chinese back, except the tanks keep on going. They just keep going? Okay. And a lot of the infantry get left there and are subsequently captured by the Chinese. Oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> Including uh, the infantry company's battalion commander, um, uh, Lieutenant Colonel Edgar Tracy, who dies in a Chinese prison. I've heard being captured by Chinese at the time was not the most... Uh, it's not great. It's not the best, best place to be. Right. They're actually better than the North Koreans because the North Koreans, a lot of cases, just didn't capture them they just executed them chinese were like oh we'll capture you <laughs> we'll torture you uh i don't know in some cases it might just be better to die so but uh colonel tracy when he heard colonel Crombus's plan now mind you he's a battalion commander in, t- in colonel Crombus's regiment is like this is a terrible plan i can't order my men to do this i'm going to share this fate with my men so he rides with his soldiers because he thinks it's a terrible plan, and he's like, I can't ask them to risk their lives if I'm not going to risk my life as well. And he does, and he is subsequently left behind. And it, like I said, he gets captured by the Chinese and dies in a prisoner of war camp. Mm, classic. Uh, and there was a, later on, there was a movement afoot to uh, try to get him a Medal of Honor. And Colonel Crombez is like, no, he's not going to get a Medal of Honor because he disobeyed my order. I told him not to go. You know, <laughs> so... Um, but ultimately, like I said, Colonel Crombez's uh, relief column does break through and it is kind of the final part of this battle. The Chinese are like, that's it. We're done. We're going home Gone, and route. the battle's over with. And it is a complete stunning UN victory. And like I said, just the numbers alone, you know, 51 allied KIA versus like 2000, you know, Chinese KIA. Yeah. I'm looking at the casualties and losses. 2000 estimated. Um, to 51 KIA, 3,000 estimated wounded to 250 estimated wounded. And about 44 missing. And 42 missing. About 42. I'm off by two. And uh, yeah, those numbers are, uh, I mean, it's pretty, it's, I'm just doing, yeah, that's very, yeah. very, that is not, uh, it's not quite uh, Battle of 73rd Easting, but. No, a, <laughs> and, and what's interesting is, um, uh, when I talked to the veterans and I interviewed the veterans, they were literally talking about like, yeah, so our trucks would pull up and we would stack the bodies like cordwood. <laughs> Jeez. This is the Chinese dead. There's thousands. Yeah. And, and it was, I mean, when you talk about bitter warfare, this is pretty much some of the worst warfare that we've seen uh, that the Americans have ever had to experience. The Chinese were very reluctant to surrender. One of the things they would do is they would play dead. The battle dies down. 
and then they would get up, usually with a hand grenade or something, and then charge a foxhole and try to blow up the foxhole. So as a result of that, it just became common practice after the battle was done, U.S. soldiers would basically move around the dead and they would make sure everyone's dead. Mm. And so, you know, you'd basically be like... And there were instances uh, where, you know, Lieutenant McGee actually talks about this because he goes out, he did one of these things where he had to go out in front of his platoon battle position and be like, all right, we got to make sure these guys are dead. And there were a couple instances where Chinese... They suddenly, weren't dead. They suddenly sprang to life and tried to kill him. And it was an absolutely no-holds-barred, you know, type of warfare. Primal. Right. That it's interesting because the guys, and I've talked about this in the book, the guys who had fought in the Pacific in the World War II were much better mentally prepared because it was very similar uh, in the Korean conflict. And there were guys who fought in the European theater and then fought in in Korea, and they were like, it was nothing like that. <laughs> yeah, this is a problem. Um, so so what came of this? What came of this battle? Like, what, what was the aftermath that you could say, as a result of this battle, this is now so, a thing? Yeah, the fourth phase offensive was a complete disaster at that point. It, w- it was done. It, it was completely unsuccessful. And eventually there's one more offensive, which is the fifth phase offensive, which happens in the summer. But even then... Um, the Chinese high command, with the exception of Mao Zedong, he was the one that was still pushing it, was like, we are not pushing the U.S. forces, the U.N. forces off the peninsula. It's not going to happen. We just, we can't do it. So this kind of was like a right. Gettysburg. And one of the things that came up was we can't afford, and you mentioned those numbers, we can't afford that loss ratio where we're killing 51 U.S. And, you know, French, and they're killing 2, several thousand. It's 20 to 1. And uh, and it also validates Ridgeway's uh, tactics. And so Ridgeway comes up with two more operations, and they are not very politically correct. It was Operation Killer and Operation Ripper. And literally, Operation Killer's sole purpose was to kill... As many Chinese. Maximum. Yeah. Yep. That was that was the task. Task. Destroy as many Chinese soldiers as you possibly can. Mm. Bar none. Implied task. Request right. more ammo when needed. And uh and what the ultimate goal was was to inflict so much punishment on the Chinese army that the Chinese army, because they knew at this point it really isn't the North Koreans that were trying to get to the peace table. It's the Chinese. If the Chinese eventually agreed to come to the peace table. That's when this war ends. And uh, and so it's all about inflicting this absolutely insane amount of punishment and so that the Chinese don't get a lot for, you know, what they lose. And, and you see that again in the fifth phase offensive. Uh, and they actually even call the process the meat grinder. Oh, jeez. Okay. And it's basically, hey, at this point, you know, at their core level, support zone, we're going to start attacking with aircraft. And at this point, now it's close attack aircraft. And at this point, it's division artillery. This is like right out of the IPB manual. Right. Like I've seen zone control on right. a core level. Like it literally has and so lines, that, distribution, just like that. And the plan is, so like if this a Chinese unit starts out as a division, by the time it makes direct fire contact with whatever U.S. It's a UN, platoon. It's a, yeah, it's, it's significantly smaller than what it was. Um, Interestingly enough, so the fifth phase offensive ends in the summer of 51, and that's it. Okay? But you're like, hey, the war lasts for two more years. Yeah. What's going on? It's really, from that point on, it's no longer a war of movement. It becomes something analogous to World War One. It's just trench lines. Just fronts kind right. of oozing. And it's all more or less, and it's basically what the 38th parallel is today, because that's basically where the lines... We're frozen. Uh, War is weird. And what happened after that was Mao Zedong finally admitted, he's like, yeah, we're not going to kick the Americans off the peninsula. We want to have the 38th parallel follow train that is advantageous to either us and the North Koreans. And that's what they basically spend for the next two years is, you know, that's where you get the stories of like Pork Chop Hill and stuff like that. Uh, But for the most part, there isn't a lot of movement 
from that point on uh, in the war. So there really is two very distinct phases, you know, in the war. You know, 51 and 50 it was very much a war of movement, offense. And then from that point on, after the fifth phase offensive, it's World War Just I. stagnant. Trench warfare. And it really was. It was literally... Those trenches, I mean, like I said, it's basically what the 38th parallel is today is more or less those lines that were agreed upon at the end of the war in 1953. So did anything else come out of this? Did any, did any uh, like, heroes or medals? Uh, yeah, so, yeah. What else came out of this battle? Yeah, so 23rd Infantry Regiment was awarded the uh, Presidential Unit Citation, which is basically the equivalent of Medal of Honor for a unit. For a unit, yeah. Yeah. Um, there was one Medal of Honor winner, a guy by the name of Sergeant First Class uh, William Sitman, and uh, he won the Medal of Honor because the classic way to do it, he th- Chinese grenade, he throws himself on the grenade and dies. I feel like that's a very was it quintessential, like yeah, if you're going to show someone doing something heroic, I have them sacrifice their life. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, that's a pretty standard Medal of Honor. I mean, that's like, how do I win the Medal of Honor? That's pretty much a guaranteed way. <laughs> I'm trying to find it here. In, uh... oh, here we go. Uh, Medal of Honor. Uh... Sergeant First Sergeant Class. Sergeant William Sitman. Yep. Threw himself on a grenade to save five of his comrades. Yep. Okay. And so that's how he does it. Uh, Colonel Freeman, um, despite, you know, um, pissing off his corps commander... Uh, General Almond, it does not affect his career. He ends up becoming a general, uh, so clearly does not impact him. Ridgeway thought the world of him, so he's like, I don't care what your corps commander thinks. I think you're you're the bomb. You're the bee's knees. Yeah, so uh, <laughs> the so, bomb. Yeah, so he does pretty well um, career wise, and Ridgeway eventually replaces MacArthur. So when MacArthur gets fired in April '51, Ridgeway takes over uh, as the overall theater commander. Uh, and he, of course, goes on to you know, great things. Uh, but yeah, like I said, it's from that point on, the the nature of the war in Korea changes. And so <clears throat> close it out real quick. Uh, if somebody wants to read your book, what difference do they get? Like what more do they are they going to find in the book? Like what more detail do they get? What more is it? Because you gave us an hour right. of... Yeah, um, it really goes into... So I only briefly touched on Twin Tunnels. Twin Tunnels is a, is a pretty important battle in and of itself. Uh, and there's a lot of cool, compelling stories. So it's kind of integral to understanding. Right. And and then just the the human interest stories that go on. Like when I go into, you know, G Company's defense on the night of the 14th, 15th, I'm literally like, hey, this guy in this foxhole is, you know, Engaging this many Chinese. And this is from journals, interviews, yep. stories. I did a bunch of interviews. Uh, also, I looked at the after action reports, uh, went to the, uh, got all those things uh, from the uh, Army Annex in College Park, Maryland, which is where the Army keeps all their unit after action reports and unit histories. And yeah, and like I said, I interviewed a bunch of veterans personally. Um, and there's all kinds of, like I said, there's all kinds of crazy stories. And the French, there's a big, you know, collection of stuff that the French battalion has. Uh, and those guys were crazy. Like, <laughs> nice. Uh, well, you said they were comprised of right. like elite people, right. not really. One of the things they would do is, if they were able to get a Chinese bugle, they would start blowing the bugle to confuse the Chinese soldiers. And that was one of their TTPs. They'd be like, "Hey, we're going to start blowing this bugle because we know that's what the Chinese use for signals." You'd think somebody would have thought, "Let's bring and, our own bugle." And um, and so common. they would do that to confuse the Chinese attackers. Uh, Monclar, that's awesome. Yeah, he's a larger than life figure himself. The guy who was the battalion commander, who was a three star general, and is like, ah, I'm gonna fight. I'll I'll take the demotion just so I can fight the communists. Um, he's a pretty you know colorful individual. And like I said, talking to the soldiers and their opinions of Colonel Freeman, and you see that kind of if it's done right, there really is a really strong bond between the individual soldier and that commander. And, you know, you think about, you know, privates, you know, a brigade commander, that guy is somewhere... Way in the clouds. Right. And that is not the perception that you get from these soldiers. They're like, that man saved our lives. Mm. I owe my life to that, you know. So could, could they make a decent movie out of this? Oh, absolutely. But no one has. No one has. Ah, and 
you know, and I would argue, especially in today's day and age, because you know who's making movies about the Korean War? The, the French? China, no, the Chinese. Oh, the Chinese. And their version of the Korean War is very different. <laughs> oh, um, yeah, I didn't, yeah. And some of their most popular movies are, hey, we beat up on the Americans. Crushed you them. Know. Uh, yeah, they have, there are movies about the uh, second phase offensive, the November, December massive counterattack where they push the evil American capitalists back across the 38th parallel. I swear. And so... I feel educated again. Right. One I could argue, educated. yeah, we should do movies about this because like, hey, if you're going to do movies, we need to do movies. So, all right. That's the battle. Chip young Uh The Gettysburg of, of the Korean War, Chip young Um What battle are you going to do next? We'll see. Oh, I might, we might do Waterloo. Nice, nice and vague. Yeah, we might do Waterloo. We'll see. Uh, uh, but I wanted to do this one just because it's, it's I think it's worth doing. Yep. All right. So, cool. Cool. Thank you.